Hi. In this video, I want to talk about epistemic uncertainty. So this is a little bit of a head scratcher topic, but an important one for getting our ground motion hazard calculations correct. All right. So just as a reminder, epistemic uncertainty, when we say epistemic, we're talking about lack of knowledge uncertainty. So this is not the variability associated with earthquakes occurring randomly in time and things like this. This is our uh, lack of understanding of the processes that are producing the seismic hazard. Right? So we've, we've had a lot of models we've put forward. We say magnitude distributions are Gutenberg-Richter. But what if they aren't? Or there's a moment rate that we have to balance or a rate of earthquakes that we have to target with our source model. But what if that's not the right number? What, what if a source is more active than we think it is based on the evidence that we've collected? And we have these ground motion models to predict ground motion intensity, but there's debates over those, right? There's debates over the, the intensity of shaking at very close distances where we don't have very many observations, or there's different published models that have differing predictions somewhat. And that's all reflecting our lack of knowledge, right? We don't perfectly understand the activity rates of seismic sources or the processes that produce seismic waves and shaking. And so we need to reflect that lack of knowledge in our assessments and not just pick a set of models and then be overconfident that we've fully understood the problem. And epistemic uncertainty is the topic that we're dealing with here. And logic trees is the way that we deal with this epistemic uncertainty in our hazard analysis. So I've got a schematic diagram shown here on this slide. So, so let's talk this through. The, the idea is there's going to be a set of issues that we have epistemic uncertainty associated with. So I've labeled that at the top kind of aspects of the model with the epistemic uncertainty. And just generically right now, we'll call that kind of component A, component B, component C, right? This could be the activity rate of earthquakes or the maximum magnitude that a source could produce or the you know particular ground motion model we choose, let's say. We'll make this more concrete with an example in a second. And I've labeled up some things here. So we'll have, we'll start over on the left and then we'll say, when we come to model component A, there'll be a set of alternatives, right? So I drew in kind of three alternatives here. And typically these are different models, right? So we might say there's a model with a maximum magnitude of eight, and there's a model with a maximum magnitude of 7.6 or something. And there's evidence for those cases, so it's debatable, and so we'll have to carry some of these multiple candidate models through. Okay, And so each of the uh, models is going to be on its own branch of the logic tree. So we'll talk about logic tree branches. And then each of those models is going to have a weight. Right? And the weight is a probability from 0 to 1, and it reflects our confidence. So if we were perfectly confident about some aspect of the model, we could just have a single branch with a weight of one on it, but oftentimes we're not certain. And so we'll consider multiple candidate models and they'll have different uh, weights on them. Um, if we're totally uh, unclear of which one is the preferred one, we might have equal weights on them. If we have a preferred model, it might have a higher weight, but there's some other models we can't fully exclude and they might be present with lower weights. But across all these set of branches, the weights need to sum to one. So the idea is that we'll say one of these models is the correct model and our, those weights reflect our degree of belief that's the correct model. And so collectively we'll have a probability distribution across those candidate models reflecting our epistemic uncertainty, but probability distributions need to have outcomes that sum them. Okay, so we'll go through model component A, we'll come down to the next component of the model, component B, and we'll have another kind of node with a set of branches around some other aspect of the model. Right, so this could be um, the location of the fault or something like that. So we'll have a new set of models, we'll have a new set of weights, and that's all conditional on the previous model. Right. So in the way this diagram is drawn, those models are conditional on being in model A3. So if model A3 has some specific faults associated with it, then the fault locations in model B would be conditional on that. So these are kind of conditional probabilities. Oftentimes, we will have sometimes we'll have uh, model branches that are different depending on the the parent branches. Sometimes we'll have them be the same. So <clears throat> I have that drawn in. And for model component C, the coming off of model B one, we've got three branches drawn in here, and then we'll oftentimes just label the other branches. It just says as above, which means model B two has the same branches for model C as model B one does. Okay, so if we just say Look, they're independent of each other, model B and model C. They could just be paired up and we'll just say they all have the same. Or we could have differing branches down their model components as needed. I'll show you a picture in a second to illustrate. Okay, but if we trace through all the way through one of these sets of um, branches, 
So let's say we go model A3 to model B1 to whatever the bottom branch here is. Eventually we'll get to the end and that's what we could call a terminal node. So we got to the end of the whole thing. And here we have a fully specified model. So every aspect of the model that needs to get specified got specified through these different sets of branches, component A, B, and C in this case. And so now we can do a calculation, right? And so we have a, a full hazard curve. And that's actually, so we can point to that from the text down below as well. So each terminal node down here, because it's fully specified, we can now compute a hazard curve, right? So we can get um, versus lambda and get a hazard curve. And we're going to do that calculation just like we've been doing in the previous videos, except now we're going to put a little K on the rates and the probabilities, which is indicating that this is terminal node K. So whatever aspects of the model were needed here, that's going to affect the in general, the rates of the ruptures. So we'll put a little K subscript or superscripts there. The logic tree might affect the ground motion predictions, or in general it does. So we'll put a little superscript on the probability. And then our ground motion hazard curve on the left-hand side is also going to have a K superscript, right? And in general, for each one of these pair sets of all these branches, when we get to a different terminal node, we'll have a different ground motion hazard curve because some of the inputs were specified differently. So we'll have a set of hazard curves associated with a set of possible model inputs for our calculations. So we've got its own hazard curve. It also has a weight. Um, and in this case, it's going to be equal to W A3 times W B2 times dot. Right? So we're going to take the weights associated with each of the branches, which is the probability of going into that branch based on our degree of belief or our confidence. And each one of those branch splits is a conditional probability, conditional on what came before. So we'll multiply it out, all those conditional probabilities, to get a weight for that terminal node. And because the branch weights all sum to one, the terminal node weights are also going to sum to one in this way. Right? So let's take a look at a more realistic one to try to make this a little less, less abstract. I know that was a lot to talk through here in one slide. So here is a plot. This is from the 2008. Uh, USGS uh, National Seismic Hazard Maps for the United States. This is for California area. There's some different logic trees for different parts of the country. That doesn't matter too much here. But let's move from left to right. So we start off with a fault model, right? So we have to have a model for where the faults are. And there's debate over how we segment those up and slice them out and things. So there was a fault model 2.1 and a fault model 2.4. There were possibilities. And we can see down here, these are the weights uh, in parentheses on the underside labeled, right? So this is the weight. And then this is on the top is the name of the branch here. Okay, so we've got 50-50 on these two different fault models as we get started. Then we head into the deformation models. So this is how the crust is deforming and that's going to put slip onto the different faults. And so we have different models. So here they're calling them 2.1, 2.2, For fault model 2.1, fault model 2.4 at the bottom has got a different set of deformation models. So here the fault models and the deformation models are paired. They're not independent and you've got different branches or different sets of branches for the top and the bottom. All right, so we get through the fault models, deformation models. Now we're to earthquake rate models. So how often did all these different ruptures occur? And in this case, we're gonna say all six branches that we've gotten to so far are the same. So we have as below and as above named. We don't have to replicate the branch for every case. We'll just do it once and we'll say all six of the deformation model nodes have the same thing. So we've got magnitude area relationship. So that's those models predicting given the fault rupture area, what's the magnitude. We've got some kind of type A fault models. We won't go through all these, but you can see there's a set of decisions around the earthquake rate models that branches out throughout. And then on the very far, we get to the ground motion models. And so we say there's more than one model to predict ground motions. In this case, they use three different models and they all had equal weight, one third, one third, one third, unable to decide that one of those models was preferred, but there are differences in the predictions and we want to reflect that as a true epistemic uncertainty. Okay. Then they've put some further um, epistemic uncertainty in saying just because there's three published models that are credible, doesn't mean that's the only three things that could happen in terms of uh, ground motion results. So in this extra branch out here, they put some extra variability in and said, 
rather than try to come up with more models beyond the three, when there's really only three kind of respected models in this part of the world, we're going to take each of these models and we'll put some perturbations on here and say, what if the model was a little bit under predicting or what if the model was a little bit over predicting? Let's consider those possibilities. So you can see the details of these aren't so critical today, but you can see there's a whole set of aspects of the models around defaults and the rates of earthquakes and the ground motions, all of which have epistemic uncertainties and all of which need to get tracked in these logic trees. Okay, to illustrate in a little simpler case, let's think about our basic Gutenberg-Richter calculation that we've been carrying through for a long time. But we're going to consider three parts of the model as uncertain, and we've got a little simple logic tree here. So we have the basic earthquake rates on the left. So our standard calculation that I've been illustrating with is, has the 0.05 rate of earthquakes with magnitude greater than 5 per year. But let's just say that was up for debate, and there's some possibility it was a little higher or some possibility it was a little lower. And so we'll have kind of three branches there. Then we could have the maximum magnitude be up for debate. And so here, let's have a 8.0, a 7.8, and a 7.6 on the upper end of the truncated Gutenberg-Richter distribution. And then let's have a ground motion model be uncertain. So we've mostly been working with the bohr joiner fumal 97 model for our basic calculations. The Cho and Young's 2014 is another model we've used a little bit in looking at Ground motion predictions, this is a more modern prediction. And then another more modern prediction, this is Bohr et al. 2014. And the accurate, so it's Bohr and the other authors are indicated by those extra letters. I'll just write Bohr et al. for simplicity. So we have rates of earthquakes, maximum magnitudes, and then ground motion predictions. And I just put as below and as above to say what's replicated in every case. So we'll have three times three or 27 different um, permutations of ways that these models could come together, 27 terminal nodes, and 27 hazard curves. Okay, so let's take a look at what that looks like. The bottom right plot is probably the easiest one to look at. So we have, uh, instead of a single line for a ground motion hazard curve down here now, we have 27 lines of these little kind of light colored cases, and those are labeled as individual branches. And so first we could just plot out all 27 of them. Not all 27 of them are equally weighted though. If, you, if we go back, you can see that the weights are not one third, one third, one third. Some of them have higher weights than others in just for sake of illustration. And so we, it's not that we just have 27 equal votes here. Some of the votes count a little bit more than others. So what we can think about here is if we pick a rate of, sorry, pick an intensity measure, and I'm gonna pick uh, 0 0.4 G here to, for illustration. We could draw up through all these hazard curves and say, at 0.4 G, I've got 27 different estimates of the annual rate of exceedance. And so the annual rate of exceedance is actually a random variable here, right? I've got this distribution represented by these discrete 27 cases, but I could illustrate it in as with a continuous probability distribution and say, look, there's this range of rates, and I don't know exactly the rate because I have this epistemic uncertainty. So what we can do is say the rate is a random variable here, and let's make a CDF for it, right? So the rate is our random variable. It's illustrated by our kind of lower right uh, PDF. And so the probability that the rate lambda is less than some value small l, what we'll do is we'll say, I'm going to add up all of the weights for terminal nodes k. So each one of those terminal nodes has got a, a weight wk. And I'm going to add up over all the k's such that rate is less than some value l. And so if we, and that, that's what I've got shown on the um, top right here is a cumulative probability distribution for the rate. <laughs> this is weird, right? So the rate, it has its own probability distribution. And if we pick like a rate of, say, well, this is something like 0 0.6 times 10 to the minus 3, I could find... 0 0.6 times 10 to the minus 3 in this lower plot here, and I could find how many my hazard curves were, gave me a, a rate less than 0 0.6, and what were the weights for those cases, and I'll add them all up, and that's going to be the y-axis value on my top right plot. So I can see all of the logic tree branches said that the rate should be at least 0 0.1 times 10 to the minus 3 or something like that, and all of them said that the rate should be less than 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3. But in between, they varied a bit, depending on those different characteristics that we 
varied. So we have this kind of stair-steppy cumulative distribution plot with 27 steps in it, and the heights of the steps are those weights from the terminal nodes. Right? So that's our kind of full probability distribution. We can compute a few different things off of this distribution. Right? So we could compute the median value, which in this case is about 0 0.6, and so I've actually got it labeled probably a little bit wrong in my figure down below. I've got the median drawn in with the dashed line. So we could do this at every uh, spectral acceleration intensity and draw a median hazard curve. That would be the median rate, where half of the logic tree weight is below that and half of it is above. We could also compute some other percentiles. It's not uncommon to look at like 15th percentile and 85th percentile to get a range. We could also compute a mean rate. So that's my bottom equation here. So we could say for each rate, I'm going to take the rate times the probability that rate is the correct weight per my epistemic uncertainty assignments. So it's a rate times a weight. We'll sum that up over all of the models, and that'll give me an expected value of the rate, right? And that's drawn in with the vertical line in the top right figure here at something like 0.7. It turns out the mean rate is the kind of theoretically uh, appropriate number to be using if we're going to make some decisions later on about safety of structures and things like that. We'll return to this topic later, but the mean is the standard metric that we output and use. So when we go to a place like the US Geological Survey ground motion hazard curves, and we just download a single hazard curve, this whole story that we just went through is not explicit for us. They just give us a single hazard curve and they're giving us the mean hazard curve. All right. So that's reflecting epistemic uncertainty and that some of the values are higher and some are lower, but our just summary metric out the back is going to be the mean hazard curve it comes from OS. Okay, so a lot to think about, but we, we have the, all the machinery to do this. We just have to compute hazard curves for different permutations of model inputs. We have to put weights on things. That's a little bit tricky to decide what those weights are going to be. But then we can proceed getting the sets of hazard curves and computing median ground motion hazard curves and mean ground motion hazard curves. Okay, so that's the machinery of dealing with epistemic uncertainty. We'll return to that topic later on, but this is a good first glance through at uh, all the mechanics we need to think about epistemic uncertainty. Okay, so that's it for now.